Thank you very much, Peter. We do have time for some questions now, and thank you to everybody that's asked questions uh, through the, the Menti website. Um, if you want to vote now, uh, people have been voting, but if you want to continue to vote to get some of those questions a bit to become a bit more prominent, um, uh, just a reminder, menti.com, and then the number to pop, pop in is 61649. Hit ask a question, and then you can upvote and downvote as you like. Um, the, the top question, which I think we will start with, which has just got another upvote as I speak, uh, is something that I'd like to put to all of you looking through your, the prisms that you, that you have this morning. What is the biggest single thing that the private sector or the government could do to get agriculture to $100 billion? What's the, the one roadblock, if you can identify it? Steve, do you want to start, Hadfield Dots? <sighs> Yeah, it's a great question. I don't think there's an easy answer. Um, so, so from my perspective, um, as somebody who's played a lot in the policy space, um, the, the blunt truth is that uh, policy has done its best job when it's got out of the way. Um, so while there's still clearly a, a role for government on a number of fronts, um, providing information, which I talked about in my talk, particular future scenarios, now the future is it's much less certain, um, you know, freight and logistics, regional airports, uh, if they're required. The, there's a bunch of things there. Um, but, but in the government's court, probably the only uh, really big thing we can be doing uh, is investing in R&D and making sure it's well spent. Um, so I won't uh, argue with, with, with Peter's point about uh, the quantum in, in Australia. Um, but, but at the very least, make sure that what you've got you're using as well as, as possible and, and be pretty bloody minded about it. So, so we might need to upset some apple carts there over time, um, but, but uh, I think we all have a strong shared interest in, in getting that right. Well, upset apple carts is what journalism thrives on, so that's a very good answer. Uh, Stephen. I think from the private sector point of view, um, obviously working for a very large bank, um, you know, the access to capital, uh, risk management, um, perhaps uh, better use of data, so more openness to um, different forms of capital, different forms of management, different forms of um, uh, you know, planning for the future. Okay, and Peter? Uh, well, I think to get to 100 billion, you need two things. One is you need, um, you need productivity and you need demand because um, you can have excellent productivity but if you don't have the demand it's not going to make that much difference. So productivity I, I very much agree uh, with what's being said. I think R&D is a crucial element to that, not the only element but a very crucial element. Demand I think is essentially an offshore story, not exclusively an offshore story but essentially an offshore story and so that means uh, doing what we can, uh, certainly at the government level, but not just at the government level, in ensuring that we can get access to markets so that um, our 100 billion mm. production actually can go somewhere. Okay. Uh, our next question has, uh, and I've wanted to say this forever, I haven't managed to say it on radio yet, has shot up the charts with a bullet next to it. Uh, what is, um, that's actually right, gone right to the top, uh, and it's probably potentially best directed to Stephen, but if others want to chip in as well, uh, what is the doomsday scenario for Australian agriculture if the coronavirus crisis continues? You want this Stephen or that yes, Stephen? I'll take Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I prefer Stephen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, well, I would imagine that um, there's no containment um, and the death rate increases dramatically. Um, I, you know, the, the, the reports are people are working on, you know, vaccines, but if that's not successful, and we've actually uh, to get, you know, human to human transfer without anybody having ever been to China, you know, the people involved. So um, you get a complete shutdown of our export sector Nobody in, nobody out. That would be pretty dramatic, and there's not much a government could do to um, to offset the impact of that. Does it point to an over reliance on China? Well, um, I wouldn't use the word over reliance. I mean, if I think if we look at uh, countries around the world, 
and you know we want to be outwardly focused and we've only got 25 million people here we need a much bigger market than just what we can provide uh, if you want to be focused on the global economy I, it's hard to imagine a better country to be focused on than China for Australia's trading relationship I, I, I agree you know India and other ASEAN countries and Japan are really important as well but um, you know, people often say, oh, we're too reliant on China, but if we're going to be reliant on someone offshore, that's probably a good, pretty good choice. OK. Our next question, uh, how will an Australian farm biodiversity payment scheme avoid the peril of moral hazards and fraud, which has negatively impacted farm productivity in similar schemes in the EU and US? Uh, Steve hadfield Dodds. So, so I think the... The beginning of that answer uh, is that we're starting from a different place. Uh, and so the, the US and the EU both had you know, extremely ill-advised um, uh, systems where they're paying farmers huge amounts of money. It's a, it's a place that we've never been. Sometimes we look enviously across the ocean at that. Um, uh, and so those schemes, when they're rebadged, were always first and foremost about continuing to deliver money to farmers um, and, and to put a green veneer on them. Um, uh, my personal view, I won't speak as ABES director here, my personal view is that will never fly in Australia. Uh, and so uh, in my talk I, uh, I talked about the, the two key things. It's got to be attractive to farmers and it's got to have an underlying constituency that thinks it's worth the money. You know, if you're talking about uh, 200 million or a billion dollars or, or whatever it is, um, it's not so much the, the size of the ticket, it's the value provided. Um, now, uh, I know fr from a long track record that Australia has really good research in this area about assessing those benefits, about targeting them to the right areas. Um, the, uh, the art will be to keep it simple enough to work um, while credible enough to, to, to you know, deliver that value for money. And I think that's, that, that's quite feasible for us to do. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, with climate change increasing extreme weather event variability, will mitigation be enough to ensure future agricultural growth uh, or should government focus on reducing greenhouse gas emissions? Happy to open that up to whoever would like to answer that. Everyone just looked at you, Steve. <laughs> okay. I was going to say all of the above. Yep. So I think... Um, Response, policy response to climate change has to be a bit of everything. Um, agricultural policy, uh, greenhouse uh, abatement, um, uh, electricity generation policy, you know, water policy, new, new sources of energy, things like hydrogen, you know, basically everything. Uh, your thoughts, Peter? Um, well, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think you do have to do both. You have to um, have a strategy for mitigation and um, you have to have a strategy for bringing emissions down. Obviously, the latter is um, a global strategy because um, ultimately it won't work un unless it, it is global. Um, and I think the question is, what is the best way to do that? And at the moment, the debate seems to be around whether you set targets or whether you work hard on technology, um, I suspect we'll end up with a combination of the two, but in my mind there's no question that ultimately uh, if we are going to get there, we'll get there through technology. And indeed this next question in a semi-way ties into that, a question about water usage in Australia. Uh, what could be done to build agricultural industries in northern Australia as water becomes more expensive in the southern states? And certainly that has been, uh, you know, the white whale for a long time, the idea that the north will be the saviour of Australian ag and that's where the growth is. Uh, Steve Hadfield Dodds, what do you think? Yes, yeah, so, so there's two, two parts. So, so water in, the, in northern Australia is very different. The country is largely flat. Um, water arrives at the wrong time of year and, it, and it, it's difficult to create water storages in the same way uh, as we have in the Murray-Darling Basin and elsewhere. So, so if you're building new water-based um, development, it needs to look different and operate differently. And we should short, certainly uh, explore that. Uh, where the value proposition 
um, stacks up. The, the point about water becoming more expensive in southern states is just a different way of saying water is becoming more valuable in southern states. So, so people never pay more than they can afford to make profit out of the water use. It's just we're unlocking more and more ways to do that, and we've hit, you know, the the barrier, the the amount of water that there is in uh, available in the system. Uh, and so, uh, in some senses, to be provocative, it's brilliant. It shows that it's working, but it also, I acknowledge, is uncomfortable and difficult. And there are there are some industries which are going to have to. Um, innovate or adapt to, to make that work for them. Well, yeah, and that, I guess that's the, the flip side of the coin, isn't it? That, it? that a number of industries will likely be pushed to the margins, as you showed in that slide, almonds growing, uh, crops like rice look less viable in a way. Yep. Uh, Stephen Helmerick, is, that, is it something that you've looked at, the idea of economic growth in the north when it comes to ag? Um, to be frank, no, we haven't, we haven't looked at it closely. Um, you know, we're, I wouldn't profess to be a water expert, so, you know, you can ask economists lots of questions, but I probably shouldn't answer a question I don't have expertise on. Well, Peter, perhaps moving to you, uh, given that the, the North obviously are closer to a lot of our, our neighbours, I suppose there should theoretically be at least uh, some degree of advantage there in terms of shorter shipping times, working closely with those neighbours. Do you see a, the potential for a closer relationship between northern Australia and some of our close northern neighbours? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think we should think big about northern Australia, and I think um, uh, agriculture is a large part of what northern Australia can actually turn into, but um, it's not going to be straightforward for a whole lot of reasons, and it's going to be very expensive. Now, at the moment, I think we have... Um, a Northern Australia strategy with no resources behind it. Uh, and this is not an area that's going to develop along a sort of a Pilbara model where, you know, the private sector will basically fund the very expensive infrastructure that's needed. I mean, it is going to require, I think, some reasonably significant commitment of government funding, and I don't think there's much appetite for that at the moment. But if you, if you look at supply and demand, I mean, demand in our region, um, even if you go for less um, spectacular economic growth, is still going to be very, very strong. If you look at um, the, the numbers of the middle class across Asia over the next 20 to 30 years, and, you know, Australia is going to be remarkably well-placed to provide that if we can lift our productive capabilities and um, Northern Australia is kind of the obvious place to be going to if that's what you want to do but it's got to be done on a, on a different model in my view. Okay, thank you Peter. And ladies and gentlemen that brings us to the conclusion of this session. Thank you so much for sending all your questions in and apologies we didn't get to all of them. Uh, please join me in thanking our speakers this morning, Steve Hadfield-Dodds, Stephen Hal Merrick and Peter Varghese. <laughs>